Thanks very much, everybody, for attending today's sessions as well. So just to let you know that I don't spend much time at all researching in the area of coal seam gas because I have spent since 1997 doing most of my research in emitting emissions and mitigation around emissions, but I have in the last two years moved on to the side of looking at climate change disasters. So I think the reason that I'm doing that is because of the sense that I get about where international negotiations and so on are going. So why do I call it a slow burn? It's because of the fact that we've had such a slow process of regulation around this issue and it's ongoing. Now last night I spoke about the fact that the International Energy Agency reckoned that we could be entering a golden age of gas but only if the gas industry can get its head around some basic golden rules. And these are the golden rules that it set out, that the issues that have to be managed, and we've heard so much about this already, impacts on local communities, land and water resources, serious hazards such as air pollution and the contamination of surface and groundwater. I would have added their use of groundwater greenhouse gases at the point of production and, of course, throughout the supply chain, and that needs to be minimised. So where are we at in Australia? Well, it's really important to note that most of the regulatory activity has occurred in the past two years, even though there's petroleum legislation which regulates the licensing of exploration and production, most of the activity has occurred as a result of community pressure. So it's really important as we talk about community organisations to understand the impact which they have. Now there have been and continue to be key regulatory reforms at all levels of government. The Australian Government, the New South Wales Government and Queensland with regard to the following issues. Water, strategic agricultural land, access arrangements to land, chemicals, so BTEX is banned in New South Wales and in Queensland and technical specifications for wells. As well as the establishment of and reference to expert panels with the role to play in the development process. So these are the key areas in which there has been regulatory reform. Now on the one hand, the Australian, Australian Government has established this independent scientific expert committee and this is a national committee which has authority to consider the impacts of coal seam gas mining on water resources. So it's been set up and states have the authority to refer questions about water to the Independent Scientific Expert Committee. COAG has set up, that's the Council of Australian Governments, has set up a national partnership agreement on coal seam gas and large coal mining developments. And essentially it's that agreement which gives the states the right to refer matters to this expert scientific committee. It has also introduced reforms to the EPBCA Act, the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, and this has been very much in the media where Tony Burke has said that the Commonwealth wants a trigger in that legislation so that it can step in and assess the impacts on water of coal seam gas developments, particularly the Great Artesian Basin. Now I don't know whether you know that there's no statute, standalone statute, that manages one of our biggest and most ancient water resources in this country. So, all of the legislation to do with the Murray-Darling Basin, where the Commonwealth stepped in, excludes specifically in that piece of legislation the Great Artesian Basin. So this basin is being managed by a coordinated interstate management body. But importantly, what we have to understand is that since the early 1990s, all governments in Australia have been very committed to deregulation in the economy and that means getting rid of as much legislation as possible so as to not impinge on the ability of business to do what it has to do. And so there's been a very important COAG decision again in April 2012 
where the Commonwealth has agreed that it's going to enter into fast-track agreements with the states to transfer its Commonwealth power under the EPBCA to the state governments. So in other words, as long as the state governments have got their own processes for environmental assessment and approval, then the Commonwealth government will grant, will, will by legislation grant power to the state governments to exercise their powers in respect uh, to development. So the Commonwealth will no longer assess the environmental impacts of state developments on national significant, nationally significant uh, matters of the environment. So it will continue to assess its own actions, but it intends to pass its authority over state matters to the state governments. Now the New South Wales government, it regulates coal seam gas under the Petroleum Onshore Act and there are many, many, many provisions in that act which deal with access to land, environmental protection provis provisions and so on. But it does not deal with the key issues which has been taken to the government by community groups. So in the past two years, this is what the New South Wales government has done. In addition to all of the provisions in the Petroleum Onshore Act, it's put out its 2012 strategic land use policy and an aquifer interference policy. So this is a new layer of policies dealing with coal seam gas. Now, for example, under the strategic land use policy, there's a requirement to do uh, agricultural impact assessments specifically where the CSG activity is within two kilometers of strategic agricultural land. Now, there was an expectation that it would be banned if it was within two kilometers of strategic agricultural land, instead of which what they've done is that they've said, we've put in there requirements for agricultural impact assessments to be done. And the department has done a whole guideline on how to undertake these agricultural impact assessments, a very extensive document with lots of procedures to be gone through. Then there's a draft code of practice for CSG exploration, a code of practice for CSG fracture simulation activities, so governing fracking, a code of practice for coal seam gas well integrity, and as we know in February a two kilometre exclusion zone from uh, fracking in residential areas, unless of course, announced afterwards, unless of course the local government doesn't mind about that two kilometre exclusion zone. So what does the strategic land use policy do? Well, it establishes the position of the Land and Water Commissioner. And this commissioner is created to reassure the government and the community that the exploration assessment has occurred in accordance with regulatory requirements. So it's someone there who's going to accredit that exploration has been undertaken in accordance with all of these regulatory requirements and to oversee the implementation of a standard land access agreement for exploration activities. There's also the assessment of potential impacts on agricultural land and this must be assessed at the exploration stage through the preparation, as I said, of an agricultural impact statement. In addition, a new levy has been imposed to introduce 40 new compliance and community liaison personnel who will be located largely in regional New South Wales to explain to the community all about the regulatory arrangements around coal seam gas. So that's the strategic land use policy with respect to exploration. The key feature of this policy is mapping. So in other words that New South Wales must be mapped and there have been a number of maps already produced where strategic agricultural land can be positively identified and it's defined as highly productive land that has unique natural resource characteristics such as soil quality and reliable water access or socio-economic value 
such as high productivity, infrastructure availability, and access to markets. Now, this cell, the strategic agricultural land, ties in with yet another procedure that has been introduced uh, through the strategic land use policy, which is the gateway. Now, what happens here is that before a proposal for CSG production can proceed to the state of lodging a DA, which is a development application, it's got to go through the gateway process. And this is an independent, scientific, upfront assessment of the impacts of coal mining and CSG proposals on strategic agricultural land undertaken by a panel of independent experts and what they are required to do is to focus only on land and water impacts including the potential aquifer impacts of projects located in strategic agricultural land. They are not allowed to consider the socio-economic benefits of coal seam gas production. That will be done by the Minister. Now the important thing to notice is that the Gateway Panel cannot say no. The Gateway Panel is just a, a filter before this actually goes up to the, either the Planning Assessment commi uh, Commission or the Minister to give consent to the production of coal seam gas. So that is the strategic land use policy, introducing three innovative aspects uh, to regulating coal seam gas. Now when we look at aquifer interference, there's been an amendment to the Water Management Act, and this was an amendment in 2011 relating to aquifer interference, and basically it requires all new mining activities that take more than three megalitres a year from groundwater sources to hold a water access license. Now, in New South Wales, it's an offence to do anything with water unless you have an access license. And there are a couple of uh, exceptions from that. But this type of activity used to go ahead without a requirement that it be licensed. So now, if you're using that amount of water, it has to be licensed. And it requires the minister, before granting the license, to be satisfied that there are adequate arrangements in force to ensure that no more than minimum, minimal harm will be done to any water source as a consequence of the water being taken. So that is, the, that, that is really the threshold test. Is this activity going to have, it must have no more than minimal harm. So that is the regulation. The aquifer interference policy then establishes the minimal impact considerations. So it sets out a whole lot of levels of what will be a level one impact, a level two impact, and so on. And these relate to water dependent assets and will be relied upon by the Office of Water for providing advice to the gateway process, the planning assessment commission, or the Minister for Planning. So, as you can see in place, a policy which will assist the Office of Water to advise everyone else about whether or not these activities will have an impact on groundwater sources. The draft code of practice for CSG exploration, it's still a draft code. It deals with issues such as obligations towards landholders. So there are many, many provisions about what CSG companies should be doing with regard to their land access arrangements. The undertaking of baseline assessments of, of aquifers. There's really very little baseline information on our aquifers in Australia. So undertaking at least a baseline so that an assessment can be made of the impacts. <coughs> The duty to treat or dispose of produced CSG water, now that's water which is pumped out of the site, and uh, the question is what to do with it. Now the answer seems to be that, well, we're not allowed to have salination ponds, treatment ponds, because that destroys agricultural land, but we can treat it and just inject it straight back into the aquifer. And if you think about the Great Artesian Basin, which has water, which I understand is sort of six million years old, very little known about it, that we can simply treat produced water and 
put it straight back into the aquifer. So the New South Wales government is now developing a managed aquifer recharge policy. And then there's also a requirement that all bores be drilled in compliance with best practice under the minimum construction requirements for water bores in Australia. So that's the code of practice for exploration. Now I guess that my question to you, perhaps I won't go there yet, is you may have come to the session believing that there is little or no regulation around those who are exploring for coal seam gas or who are uh, producing coal seam gas. That is simply not the case. Okay, there is a raft of law, of regulations, of policies, of procedures that have been put in place in the past two years. So really the question is, so what's the problem then? Why can't we feel relaxed and comfortable about this technology? And I think that some of the key issues here are that we know already that the industry has jumped ahead of the game of regulation. And so there are existing exploration wells and so on out there which are not compliant with these measures that have been put in place for all new exploration and production activities. Also, we don't yet understand, because it hasn't been finalised at the COAG level, what the implications will be of the Commonwealth handover of its responsibilities to the states to approve developments. Now, Burke has said that that amendment will go ahead in terms of still allowing the Commonwealth to assess water impacts, um, but nevertheless, there is this philosophy of a move away from duplication. So why have the Commonwealth involved if it doesn't need to be involved? Also, the New South Wales government's own planning reforms are still underway. And as you may know, that really throws out 30 years of experience and jurisprudence through the Land and Environment Court of how planning and development should proceed in New South Wales. So we don't yet know the impact of those because we've only just seen the white paper about two weeks ago. I did read the, the green paper, I haven't yet seen the white paper, but we just don't know at this point. Um, and we won't know until the Planning Act is actually legislated. The procedures that have been put in place, because they're new procedures to manage CSG, are as yet untested. We really don't know how those, how the independent scientific committee at the Commonwealth level, the gateway panels and so on, how they are going to operate. But I think my principal concern is that those who are vested with statutory authority to approve exploration <laughs> and particularly production processes might not apply their minds properly to the matters that they are supposed to apply their minds to. And we already had two very important cases which specifically show us that these consent authorities are not taking into account what they should be in a proper manner. Now you've already heard from Peter Martin about the Southern Coal Alliance, but I'll just tell you very quickly. What happened there is that the Planning Assessment Commission approved that coal mine and said, as a condition of license, you can now go away and work out your water management plan. And I mean, it's just inconceivable that a consent authority would do that, not apply its own mind to a water management plan. And then with the um, Walkworth decision that you've heard a bit about as well, essentially there, what uh, Justice Preston found in a merits appeal, so he's stepping into the shoes of the minister, he's not being a judge, he's being the decision maker, is that that consent was given with, with completely inadequate um, considerations for the destruction of 760 hectares of native vegetation. Um, and not only that, but that in his opinion, the government had also, on a cost-benefit analysis, got the socio-economic 
uh, benefits of this coal mine completely wrong. Now that's going on appeal. But I think that those are the issues which still concern us from an environmental justice perspective, even though the government keeps saying the coal seam gas industry is the most highly regulated in the world. Well, yes, there's a lot of legislation and there are a lot of policies around it, but it's still a case of let's wait and see how and whether or not it is properly implemented. Thanks very much.